Hey guys, TGO back here with another video. Today is going to be the second episode of our new series of Historian Reacts. Uh, last time we reacted to Oversimplified's Revolutionary War Part 1. Today is going to be Part 2 of, um, of the Revolutionary War. Um, and the first, the first thing I want to say is thank you guys so much for the support on that last video. Um, it got over 100 views in the first couple of days um, and it's still getting views um, as I'm speaking. Uh, so just thank you guys so much for the support. Um, and if you guys are watching, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe. Uh, I want to grow this channel. I want to make it bigger. Um, I want to, you know, I want advice. Uh, what should I change? Uh, what should I do differently? Um, and, you know, I, I just want to thank you guys, I guess. Um, that's all I really wanted to say. I drew it on a little too long. But I guess without further ado, let's just get into the reaction portion of the video here with part two. Oh, wow. Washington's butt was sufficiently kicked. Winter <laughs> was here. His troops' morale was low. Some just up and left. Washington needed to do Valley something, Forge. anything to restore faith in the revolution. The British had spread throughout New Jersey and settled in for a winter of... We should just let him have New Jersey, honestly. Drinking cider and partying hard. Nobody expected an attack in the winter, so Washington started making plans for an attack in the winter. The British had hired a large force of Hessian mercenaries from the German states of Hesse Castle and Hesse Hanau to fight the rebels. It was prior to the German unification. It was these mercenaries that. Which I think I want to do like a little reaction to that, because German unification is kind of cool. Uh, it's a very big topic, though. That were stationed across the Delaware River from. Which oversimplified doesn't have a video on that, I don't believe, but I know there. Uh, I've seen some floating around YouTube before. Washington and his army, and there were more Hessian reinforcements incoming, but they made non-scheduled stop because their commander got thirsty. No, not that kind of thirsty. That kind of thirsty. It was Christmas Eve with a blizzard outside when Washington heard the Hessian money and women always gets you. Hessian defenses were down, and he decided to attack. He made a perilous crossing of the icy Delaware River with 2,400 men and marched nine miles to Trenton where he caught the Hessian forces completely off guard. After a short but fierce battle, the Hessians surrendered in droves. It was a much needed victory that sent a clear message, not only to the British, but to American- It's one of the most powerful pictures in American history, the crossing of the Delaware. So it's, it's really cool. It's definitely something that I'd like to have on a, on a wall one day across the colonies. The war was far from lost. General Cornwallis led the British forces south to counterattack the Americans, but in a series of battles, Washington's defensive positioning and flanking maneuvers defeated the British three times. This is kind of like that. The crossing of the Delaware was somewhat of a turning point in the war. Um, definitely gave the Americans momentum. In 10 days, and the British decided to abandon southern New Jersey for the rest of the winter. Washington finally set up a winter camp in Morristown, but for the Americans, there was much less partying than the British. Yeah. Elsewhere, the British had taken Newport, Rhode Island, because it was a good naval base. In the south, they failed to take Charleston, South Carolina, which left British loyalists unsupported and vulnerable to more harassment and even mass expulsion. Man, tar and feathering was honestly a very cruel, um, thing to do to someone um one is hot um hot tar so that's gonna burn then getting the feathers off if you know the the burning let's be honest the burning tar is gonna hurt a lot could could even kill you um so if you survive that getting everything off would be almost as painful i think i'd rather be dead all right let's see what Benji has for us. Congress sent Benjamin Franklin to France on a mission to convince them to join the war. And while the French generally loved any <laughs> opportunity action, to mate. hoodwink the Brits, they didn't want to join unless it was a sure win. So for now, Franklin spent his days chilling out and chasing <laughs> tail. The British Parliament couldn't believe the war wasn't over yet, and the pressure was on to end it. So the British came up with a plan. General Burgoyne in Montreal and General William Howe in New York would advance through the Hudson Valley and meet in the middle, splitting the colonies in two and thus screwing over the American communication lines. Burgoyne began his movement south, and after taking Fort Ticonderoga quite easily, he then came across heavy American resistance, so he sent Howe a dingle dongle asking if he'd be showing up anytime soon. Meanwhile, Howe had completely abandoned the plan and gone for all our personal glory by capturing the American capital, Philadelphia. He defeated Washington and his army at Brandywine Creek by using the old hit him with a decoy and flank him from behind. If you guys have never been to Philadelphia, I really recommend going there. It's very, very um, cool, especially if you're interested in American history. Um, so much of our founding happened there. Um, it's it's a high, a highly recommended place to go. Um, you can see Benjamin Franklin's grave. You can um, see where the uh, 
Declaration of Independence was drafted and signed. It's pretty cool. Philadelphia was now I enjoy it. Hands, One of my favorite Congress cities to escape to York. But Burgoyne was left on his own to face the ever-increasing American force in Saratoga. American General Horatio Gates teamed up with our old friend Benedict Arnold to deal one final blow to Burgoyne's army. Arnold wanted to take the fight to the British, but Gates wanted to wait for the British to come to them. After a heated debate, Gates, the senior officer, told Arnold to go to his room. But Arnold defied his orders, and at the Battle of Bemis Heights, he charged at the British and obliterated them. Great job, Horatio. By the way, what happened to that other guy who was in Saratoga? Who? Benedict Arnold. Never heard of him. Ouch. Hey, George. Didn't I do... So Benedict Arnold was actually a, a fairly good leader, um, but it was things where he wasn't... He wanted glory, um, which isn't... Which is not entirely a bad thing. I mean, he's doing the work. He should be recognized for it, but, you know, that is what it is. Um, can't change the past. Especially as we like to. Do a great job? Taking Philadelphia and all? Hmm? Didn't I? You're fired. Both Burgoyne and Howe returned to Great Britain, leaving British General Henry Clinton to take charge of the war. And the war was about to take a nasty turn, because with the victory at Saratoga, the French were finally ready to join the Americans. All right, Benny, we're in. Hey, isn't this kind of funny, you know, because you're a republic trying to overthrow an absolute monarchy, and I'm an absolute monarchy helping you? Like, like, could you... It's a little foreshadowing there. American Revolution is one of the precursors to the French revolutions. Uh, that would happen. Imagine if your revolution inspired my people to revolt against me, and go. then they imprisoned me and all my family, and they chopped all of our heads off. Could you imagine? <laughs> that's called foreshadowing. For now in America, oh, that's winter was here once again, which meant yet more disease, more starvation, Alley and Forge. even a little mutiny. After losing <laughs> Philadelphia, mutiny. Washington's job was again on the line. But suddenly, a Persian guy with a very fancy name, hired by Benjamin Franklin... It's crazy how fast... Um... No, he went from being, yeah, we, we want him as commander-in-chief to, ooh, he's not doing such a good job. Then, oh my god, he's doing great. You know, he's Chuck Trenton, and he's helping, uh, you know, lead the lead the fight in um, Pennsylvania and in New Jersey. And then back to, you know, when it's a standstill, not, Showed up you know, out of nowhere and not said, getting the hey. I'm here to give your man a European military training. And train them he did. They learned how to shoot accurately, how to march in formation, where to poop and where not to, and strict punishments were handed out to any who didn't comply. Washington's army came out of the winter in 1778, a new and improved force, ready to take Philadelphia back from the British. In the end, though, they didn't have to. With the French entry into the war, the British ordered General Clinton... That, um, the Valley Force thing kind of reminds me of the Patriot in a way, where the, you had the Frenchman um, that was, like, advising... Um, what's Mel Gibson's character's name? Guy from the South. Um, kind of training and, like, advising the troops. Um, and then, obviously, at the end, you get the the big battle of that, um, sees Patriot with the flag. Mel Gibson's to character. Philadelphia ...and consolidate all of the British forces in New York. So Washington sent Benedict Arnold to reoccupy and secure the city as he pursued the British through New Jersey on land, eventually finding a good opportunity to attack at Monmouth Courthouse. The battle took place on a sweltering hot summer's day, and as many soldiers died from heat stroke as they did from battle. In the end, after some incompetence slash borderline treason from Washington's second in command, it was a draw. And in this war, a draw is kind of a victory for the Americans. Next up, let's talk about this guy. This is John Paul Jones. John Paul Jones is handsome, Scottish, and absolutely insane. When the war first broke out, everyone was like, how did the colonies expect to stand up to the might of the British Navy with their meager fleet of converted merchantmen? Yep, try telling that to John Paul Jones. This guy <laughs> sailed to the British Isles, somehow captured a British ship off the coast of Ireland, and brought it back to France. Then he returned, attacking more ships, raiding towns, and evading capture the entire time. These are basically pirate tactics. But hey, yep. if it works, it works. In one incident... It's crazy. Piracy is one of those things where we think about now as, um, you know, it's just these guys doing this. But a lot of times they had, you know, they were doing it not legally, but under the guise of a of a country. And, you know, it's privateering, um, doing it in the name of a country to get things. He captured a British ship and returned to a Dutch port without an official ensign because his was lost during the battle. That's a big no-no and can have you arrested as a pirate. The Dutch helped him out by quickly creating a design based on Benjamin Franklin's description of what the American flag should look like, and they entered it into their records as an official U.S. flag. What they came up with looks pretty cool. The whole Actually, that is a pretty cool flag. British morale and brought into now, I wonder if that flag has ever been used for anything else because that honestly is a cool flag to have. I, I, I want to try to find that. I might try to see if I can't buy one. Questioned their ability to win the war. And fun fact, he was so cool that one of the towns he raided in 1778 gave him an official honorary pardon in 1999. Huh. Keep ripping in heaven, John Paul Jones. 
you're an angel now. What the Continental Navy was lacking in resources, though, the French Major entry into the war made up for. The French began with naval skirmishes in the English Channel, and they sent a large fleet to America, although it sustained a lot of damage in a storm off Rhode Island. The Americans were hoping for a bigger commitment from Island. the French, so John Adams went to France to help Benjamin Franklin continue negotiations. Oh good, you're finally here. Check this out. Hey ladies, I'd like to fly you like a kite, because you're electrifying. <laughs> Isn't this great? Is this? Is this what you've been doing? Yeah, why? We were sent here on a diplomatic mission to secure <laughs> military support from France, not to philander with the locals. Wait, no, ladies, come back. <sighs> Worst wingman ever. But the Americans would get some more help. The Dutch provided aid, although they never formed an official alliance. More significantly, though, the Spanish, who had already been alliance. providing aid, officially no. joined the war in June 1779. They would provide support in the Midwest and the Gulf Coast, campaigns that heavily impacted the Native American tribes. In it's crazy. This this war really spanned the globe. Um, I mean, everyone wanted to defeat the British. I mean, they're the biggest empire the world had seen uh, in you know a very long time, and it's... Of course, you want to get rid of your rival, and with the help for, of their own people, well, you know, their own people, um, the Americans in this case, it just kind of helps out in that favor. Areas. Both sides actually enlisted the help of Native American tribes throughout the war, sometimes even pitting those tribes against each other. In the summer of 1779, after a series of raids against the Americans by the Iroquois, Washington organized an expedition that burned down more than 40 villages, forcing the tribes to relocate to Canada for British protection. And another group that shouldn't go unmentioned were African Americans, both free Correct. and enslaved. They joined both sides of the war, hoping to gain their freedom. But afterwards, many were simply returned to slavery, particularly those who had fought for the Americans. Despite owning slaves himself, Jefferson had written a condemnation of slavery in the Declaration of Independence. But out of fear of offending the Southern colonies, this was removed from the final draft. Which, Thomas Jefferson is a, a thing of on a beast all uh in his own rights um you know there's the speculation and somewhat proof that he slept with um some of his slaves and had children with them um and some african-american people can actually track their lineage back down to him which is kind of cool but at the same time like they weren't given the same rights um you know he wanted you know he condemned slavery but he still, you know, practiced it. Um, and, you know, I'm not going to defend him. It was, you know, the the times. Um, that's how things were done. But at least he condemned it, and he knew that it was it, it was wrong, um, even though he still practiced it. So really, it's kind of a, a hypocrisy kind of thing at the same time. For the same reason, the American Army stopped enlisting African-American men in 1775, a policy that Washington, a slave owner himself, supported but they were forced to reverse the policy after the british promised freedom to any slaves who joined them in general you yep. stood a better chance of gaining freedom if you fought for the british however even those that left with the british after the war suffered mistreatment and discrimination in their new lives outside of america our good yep. friend benedict arnold is now in charge of philadelphia having a good time partying down with <laughs> and even marrying a member of the philadelphia elite the same elite that had partied down with the british when they controlled the city and suddenly the people what's that show from amc called the turn yeah, the turn, that's what it is. That's also a really good show that's kind of about the American Revolution and uh, Washington spy, uh, spy ring. And Benedict Arnold is, is a big part of that show. People of Philadelphia, including the state governor. And it, it starts off with him being on the American side. Then as the show progresses, um, he switches sides and, um, you know, which I'm pretty sure is about to happen here. Started accusing Arnold of having pro-British sentiments. To keep the people happy, Washington wrote a letter rebuking Arnold, calling his conduct imprudent yep. and improper, and that was too many ouchies for Benedict Arnold to handle. He One asked too many Washington ouchies. to put him in charge of the fort at West Point. Then he contacted the British, offering to hand the plans of the fort over to them and join their side. Be my friend. Our good friend Benedict Arnold is our good friend no more. Luckily, the treasonous plans were discovered on a captured British officer, but Arnold managed to escape before he was arrested. As a British Brigadier General, he would go on to lead raids against American cities, most notably his raid of Richmond, Virginia in 1781. His betrayal... The thing with Arnold, I mean, he knew how the Americans were running their military because, you know, he was a, you know, a big part of it. And my dog is going crazy right here. Um, and he knew, like, the cities and things like that, so it was kind of a good thing for the British... Uh, Shook George to have Washington, him take over. who had once again set up camp at Morristown. His leadership somehow held the Continental Army together through the harshest winter delicious. of the war. 
We're entering 1780, and Parliament was hopping mad that the war still wasn't over. The British debt was soaring, and despite taking parts of Massachusetts in late 1779, the North was in a stalemate. So the British decided to make a major shift in strategy to the so South, an economically rich area with a higher level of support for the British, or so the British thought. A year earlier, they had captured the underdefended city of Savannah, Georgia, easily, and a joint American-French counter siege failed. Now they laid siege to Charleston, South Carolina. It fell within months, with thousands of American troops yep. surrendering to the British, a costly defeat. The British quickly moved to take control, and they sent stereotypical Hollywood villain with a British accent, Bannister the Butcher Tarleton, into the backcountry, where he hunted down rebels and destroyed them with ruthless brutality. The British presence also inspired local loyalist militias in the backcountry to rise up against their persecutors. The British really seemed Hard to be onto something right with back. their new strategy, and the bowl was very much in Washington's court. I'm going to send my most loyal general, Nathaniel Green, to the south to stop the British. Going to have to overrule you there, George. We're sending Hero of Saratoga and your biggest rival, Horatio Gates. Watch this, George. I'm going to save the day again. Everybody will love me, and I'm going to get your job. Here I go. And he got into one battle with Cornwallis, got annihilated, and ran away. Yep. Alrighty, let's go with your guy. Nathaniel Green knew the British outnumbered his own forces. Horatio Gates probably would have been a good candidate for president, too. Um, but... He had, he had some defeats, and wouldn't be defeated as all do. Tactics. So he had to all think the box. He split his army into two, said, Hey, big boy, look at me. And mm -hmm. then they went running in two different directions. Cornwallis sent Tarleton after Morgan, and he caught up with him at Cowpens, where Morgan proceeded to kick Tarleton's butt. Then the two led Cornwallis on a wild chase through North Carolina. His bigger and better equipped army much heavier and slower than Green's quick and mobile troops. Green led Cornwallis further and further from his supply line, then crossed the Dan River into Virginia, picked up some reinforcements, and turned back to face the now exhausted British. See this this running gun tactic really benefited the Americans. Um, even before the French helped uh, train uh, American the Continental Army and things, you know, sit in the trees, shoot off a couple shots, run, and then just keep doing it over and over At again. Eventually, your enemy doesn't know the where you are. The two sides engaged in vicious close combat. Cornwallis, fearing loss, fired his big guns into the chaotic fighting, cutting down many of his own men. Green retreated, giving Cornwallis the victory, but Cornwallis lost a quarter of his men in the fighting, so it felt much more like a British defeat. At this point, both sides desperately needed something to happen soon to end the fighting. The British were running out of money, while the Americans were again facing mutinies <laughs> as the men went without pay or even basic living needs. Fortunately, the French were now showing up in greater numbers and were ready to fight. After his encounter with Green, Cornwallis decided the only way to win the South was to first prevent the Southern Continental Army from using Virginia as a supply base. So he abandoned the Carolinas, moving to Wilmington and on to Yorktown, a position the British believed would be easy to supply and support. On his march to Yorktown, he raided many farms, stealing horses and supplies from the locals, but also freeing thousands of slaves, many of whom joined him. The French saw Cornwallis's new position as an opportunity to land a decisive Play some Rochambeau. blow on the British. Washington wanted to attack Clinton in New York, but the French said it was a really dumb idea. And to be fair, it was. Instead, Washington was. sent out fake dispatches to make it look like they would attack Clinton, you, but secretly their combined force marched all the way down to Virginia. A large French fleet under the command of Comte de Grasse arrived and successfully cleared the British Navy out of the Chesapeake Bay. The combined land and naval forces then laid siege to Cornwallis's army in Yorktown. The American and French forces tightened in around the... Seizures are one of the most effective military strategies. You just, you know, wait them out. Eventually they have to come out for food. They have to do something. Um, City, raining artillery down on Cornwallis. Doesn't always work as we saw earlier. Uh, counter siege by the American and French. Um, got, uh, got destroyed. He desperately appealed to Clinton for aid. But Clinton was unusually chilled out about the whole thing. Cornwallis held out for <laughs> nearly a month before he had no choice but to surrender. Over 7,000 British troops were captured. A crushing defeat. And with that, Parliament had reached the end of its rope. The war just wasn't worth it, and it needed to end now. Everyone's the British fired. still held New York, Charleston, and Savannah, but fighting between the two sides mostly ceased as peace negotiations opened up in Paris. The resulting treaty in 1783 saw Great Britain remove its troops from American soil, recognize U.S. independence, and cede territory up to the Mississippi River. In return, the Americans agreed to pay any debt still owed to Britain, and gave fair treatment to any colonists who had remained loyal to the crown. The Spanish got Florida, while the French got an economic crisis that led to its own revolution a decade later. Washington retired to his home in Mount Vernon, wishing his men farewell by saying, I most devoutly... Mount Vernon's a really cool place, too. Um, I've been I've been there, I've been... Uh, where else have I been? Revolutionary War related. I've probably been to a couple others. I'm just you wish that your today. latter days may be as prosperous and happy as your former ones have been glorious and honorable. He hoped to live out the rest of his days in peace. But unfortunately for him, a number of people wanted him to be the first leader of the new country. And by a number of people, I mean literally everyone. The first election campaign in American history was basically a grassroots effort to convince Washington to accept the office. He was sworn in on April 30th, 
and hence why he i mean he didn't want it but he he obviously took it um and then after his terms were over he's i don't want to do this i don't want to be a monarch you know it's it's very noble of him and obviously that lasted up until fdr where presidents were just kind of like okay two terms and that's it we're not going to do it anymore and then fdr happens um you know four-term president only president to ever have four terms and now by law there can only be two terms 1789, and he himself established many of the standards and limitations of what the American leader should be. First of all, there was debate on what he should be called. Is he a king? Is he our glorious leader? In the end, they went for a word that at the time was pretty modest. President, like the president of your local bowling club or office bake sale committee. Yep. He set up a cabinet of expert advisors knowing that no president could know everything, no matter how much of a stable genius they claimed to be. He proposed major legislation to Congress and gave an annual State of the Union address to keep his own power in check. He stated that the U.S. should remain neutral in foreign conflicts. And in the end, he voluntarily gave up. I mean, that lasted. <sighs> Officially lasted. I mean, World War One. And I guess the Spanish-American War. I mean, trying to help with Spain or Cuba, I guess. But you know, World War One is that first big, big uh, foreign war we get involved in. And then obviously there's World War Two. Um, but really we get involved because of war-wise because of the the Japanese. His power after just two terms. He could have made the presidency anything he wanted, but his careful and cautious actions helped set the precedent of an office that is powerful in its limitations, decisive through its diplomacy, and respected in its humility. And so the United States was born, and everything was perfect. It had no problems, nope, not a single never, one. We've never had a problem. That would, I don't know, cause such an extreme divide that it would lead to a civil war. Anyway, moving on. Mm -hmm. Quick quiz. Name the most American thing you can think of. Baseball? Bold Eagles? Calling the winner of an America-only sports tournament world champions? Or maybe math and science? Wait, math and science? That's right. If you didn't know, science is... Well, that looks like that's the end of the episode. Um, that's just all um, add now. So yeah, I, I mean, the American Revolution obviously is a big turning point um, for the British uh, Empire. Um, it's, it's kind of the time when, you know, I think they realize, oh, we're not invincible. Uh, we got beat by a bunch of farmers and, you know, obviously the French and the Spanish helped too. But, you know, the main forces were just regular American citizens. Um, and George Washington, you know, um, his leadership definitely helped. Same with Horatio Gates and uh, the Continental Cong Congress, things like that. Uh, but you know in these videos um if i ever get a fact wrong go check fact check me like not you know, fact check me but um you know let me know if i get something wrong because i'm not going to be right 100 percent of the time there's no way that i can um there's so much information out there about um all of this kind of stuff um so yeah this has been the part two episode real really episode two of historian reacts i want to make a couple of these videos a week um, the first episode did pretty good, um, so without further ado, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and until next time, peace.